I mean, most companies you look and they go, oh, we donate 2% of pre-tax profits or something like that. You're taking all the profits and putting it back on this thing? profit and put it back, for sure. No one does that. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> You're not is, everyone. My name is Jerron, bro. You know, and, and it's very seldom people out here named Jerron. I'm not, and that's, that's not even a two mile horn. It's just, that's the way I've always been. I'm Tom Ward, and over the last couple years, I've had the chance to sit down with some of the biggest celebrities and influencers in the world. What I've always found most fascinating is the stories of the businesses that they've built behind the scenes. On this show, you'll get an inside look of what it takes to build a successful business from some of the biggest celebrities, business people, and up and coming entrepreneurs in the world. This is The Tom Ward Show. Guys, welcome to The Tom Ward Show where I interview the biggest entrepreneurs in the game. And today I got Jerron McKinley. He's a model, an entrepreneur, a philanthropist, now an artist. Yeah. You got a lot going on. Oh yeah, man, you have to nowadays. And Forbes 30 Under 30 member this year too, so congrats on that. Thank you, I appreciate it, man, genuinely. Well, I really like your story too, and we're gonna talk business, we're gonna talk philanthropy, we were talking Malcolm X before, I love the shirt. Thank you. But you've got a really inspiring story, and it's funny, I was thinking about you. You grew up in a trailer in Compton, right? Right. And now you're a model who has worked around the world with the biggest designers in the world. You're an artist, you've got your own charities, you have your own clothing companies. You're Forbes 30 under 30. Could you ever imagine this when you were sitting back in Compton as a kid? Um, nah, nah. And, and you know what, man? Um, I think that's, that's what makes life so fun. You know, like you can wonder and you can, you can wish for and you can reach for, but to the extent of where you're gonna get, you don't really know. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, again, being in a trailer, and I actually grew up in a part of, of LA that's called Willowbrook, right? Where's that at? And Willowbrook is literally this small part, and they created Willowbrook because it's where the blue line and the green line meet. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So they made that area safe because it's a transfer point, so they would call it Willowbrook. That's what they named it as. And it's literally south of Watts. Okay. It's east of LA. Yep. And it's uh, a little north of Compton. So oh, literally okay. it sits in the middle of like everything. Like an island. But my family, we bounced around every two years. And the longest place we ever lived in was that trailer. So we, we bounced from Compton. We bounced from LA. We live borderline on Watts next to Gompers Middle School. Then we went ahead and, and went back to LA, then went back to Willowbrook, and then back to LA. So every two years we were moving. Why, yeah. why two years? Just jobs changed or like getting out of a lease or what? Well, my mom's was a single mom. Yeah. So however long she could stay in a place, whether it be like maybe the rent shot up or like maybe she just didn't want to live in an area, you know, mm -hmm. whatever situation went on, yep. she grabbed us and was like, let's go. And yeah. as the kids, we, you know, we can't really dictate where it is we're going to go or how we're going to move. So we just yeah. had to go along with it. Was that tough? Because, you know, you don't, if you're moving every two years as a kid, it sucks starting a new school. The friends you just made, you got to kind of, you're the new kid in school again. Was that tough? Yeah, but when it came to school, my parents made an extra effort for me to stay in the same school. Oh, that's cool. You know cool. what I'm saying? Like, like, I went to a private school from first grade to eighth grade, and they make sure that, like, my dad made sure I stayed in the private school. Like, oh, wow. he, he made sure, and, and it might have been the best thing for me moving every two years because being a model, my life moved so much and was so fast-paced that I was already adapted to moving like that. Yeah. You know, I would move every year living in New York. I lived in every borough in New York. You know, every year I was moving with a suitcase. <laughs> Getting on a train, going to the end of the L train, moving to Canarsie, going from Canarsie yeah. all the way to Weehawking, going from Weehawking, moving to Harlem, and then and then moving back to the city. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I think I was just destined to live this life. Like it just it just everything happened the way it happened. But well, it's cool because I'm guessing. I mean, there was no blueprint for the life you're leading now. I'm, I'm guessing you didn't know any models growing up. <laughs> you nah. know what I mean? Or, nah. or anyone kind of in that world. Nah, man. And, and modeling came up funny because I was at a fork in the road. And I always tell people, like, you're going to be at a fork in the road many times in your life. And those decisions that you make, whether to go left, right, or up the middle, are going to really dictate how the rest of your life is going to go. Yeah. So at this certain point in my life, I'm 17 years old. I'm contemplating going to the service which I, I respect to the utmost, you know? And um, I had a relative who had already introduced me to modeling. He was going to a school called John Casablancas. Okay. And John Casablancas, he would teach him how to act, teach him how to model, do everything. He like, bro, you 6'2", like, you know, you should do it. Yeah. Unfortunately, he went to jail. And while he was in jail, I was like, man, I'm gonna go to the service. But we had a conversation, he like, man, find an agent 
If you don't find an agent, then do what you want to do. Mm -hmm. Just so happened I found an agent, and then from there... How I'm, do you get an agent when you're a 17-year-old kid? Like, that's a know, whole... How do you even know how to find one? Um, I met an agency, and the agency wasn't legit, but I had... I was... It, There's it wasn't. a lot of sketchy agencies Man, in modeling, isn't there? So many, and I think people got to steer clear of some and do their research. I mean, people can go to, like, models.com and really look up if an agency is legit, who's on a board, are they top 50, are they, you know, and oh, okay. really see who who is who. Um, but I didn't know that, you know, so... Um, through that relationship, I met a photographer named Tyler Adams. Tyler Adams introduced me to Jamie Wren at Click Models in LA. I just was texting, shout out to Jamie yeah, Wren. Shout out to Jamie still because, with because if it wasn't for Jamie, I wouldn't be even just sitting here. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So she's been somebody that supported me and followed me through my fork in the rows. Whether I go left or right, she's like, all right, we're going to make it work. You know? And that's cool. That says something about you too because a lot of people, you talk to a lot of people in LA and it's kind of standard, you know, somebody, some agent or manager kind of discovers that person, that entertainer, whatever they happen to be, and as they get bigger, they drop that person and then they go with you know CAA or some big management company or William Morris. Yeah, and man. you stuck with. Yeah, you know I I kept I, I did stick with Jamie. You yeah. know I thought it was it was important to stick with Jamie because she was the one that believed in me from the get go, doing something I never thought I'd be doing. You know what I'm saying? So it's like imagine going into a world not knowing anybody, and then you with the one person you you know can help you through this and yeah. you leave them to me it didn't sit right i wasn't raised like that yeah. you know so i think if if you know young kids want to model or do anything like that mm -hmm. like first they got to respect the people that they doing business with you know and if you respect the person you're doing business with keep them with you because they'll take you a long way yeah. you know a manager gonna get you in positions that you've never been in before and that you probably will never get in by yourself mm -hmm. and you'll probably be in positions that you know, a person who like doesn't believe in you and just want to take your money, yep. they they'll never get you there. You've got some hustle to you, and you can't you can't teach that. I found you know either it's something you kind of have or don't. You can't learn that in the classroom. But did you get a lot of it from your mom? Because she was a single mom, and you, I think I read that she worked. She always had two jobs. Yeah, hundred right? percent. Yeah, mom's is a hustler, man. Nice. And, and even to this day, she's still working. You know, I I could try to. Tell her, like, mom, just sit down. Like, she can't sit still, you know? And, and you know, alongside that, I got relatives who, you know, when I grew up, we were selling shoes on the street, like, you know, in this front porch, he would set up a table in a U-shape, and we would bring out almost, like, you know, 300 pairs of shoes from inside the house, bring them out every single day, then take them back in. So, really, my, my godfather taught me how to hustle. Okay. My godfather taught me how to hustle, man, and, and he really was, like, on it, like, I never seen nobody hustle like that. You know, yeah. he went from having a shoe store in the front of his house to having his own spot. Oh, really? Exactly, 100%, man. So it was it's, it was those things that kind of opened my mind. And although I didn't know where I could take it, mm -hmm. it was like, man, I'm just going to do what I can with it. You know, yeah. and it's just so I've been modeling fell in my lap, man. Yeah. It was just that thing. It's one of those things, I mean, unless you have it, it you can get so wrapped up in self-doubt. Whatever you're trying, especially if you have a big dream like modeling, you know, you can want, you know, it can go hour to hour where you're confident it'll happen. And then the next hour you go, I'm insane. This is never going to happen. There's a million better looking people than me out there. Why would they even pick me? I should just give up. You know, you have any advice for kind of going out doubt. and getting it? Yeah. Yeah, I think doubt is something that you always going to do it. You know, you have to wake up every day and be like, that shit ain't about to mess with me. That's that, that. Doubt is not about to mess with me. And you have to really think that that's a continuous fight. That's not just a fight that is just once you tell yourself it's done and I'm not going to doubt myself, you stop doubting yourself. You know, it don't really work like that. So the only advice I would give is like the, when you wake up in the morning, mm -hmm. decide to fight that battle that you ain't going to believe in your doubts. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's like good that's. Advice. I mean, that's what it is. Even me fishing for the music industry now, I take all my knowledge of business and taking it to the music business. Mm -hmm. It's like I could wake up every day and be like, man, I'm and I was like, man, I should just take a model. But at the end of the day, what fun is that? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You got to like, expand and you gotta grow. Expand, you got to grow, you know? If what, you ain't growing, you're dying, right? What, what good is a banana tree that don't grow bananas? <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> no, nah, that's real. What yeah. good is it? I mean, it's just a tree, yep. you know? So that's, that's the way I see it, man. You got to fight your doubts every day. You got a good attitude. And I read somewhere that, like, when you were, even when you were, like, 19, and I think you said you were in every store you were modeling for Levi. So you were like in every yeah. store that sold Levi's, like right there. And you felt like that wasn't enough. Like you wanted to give back. Now, me at 19, I'm thinking girls, 
money and partying, which I'm sure most 19-year-old guys would be thinking about. What makes you different? Like, who's thinking about giving back at 19? Um, the, the thing is, and what people got to understand is that I'm not different. And that's the thing. Like, I was thinking about women partying yeah. and drinking, and, and I was doing all those things. Sure. And I, but around the world, you know what I'm saying? So I think what it was is I always lived a fast life. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I grew up hustling. We grew up in a neighborhood where you had to grow up fast. So I always knew the, the fast lifestyle. So yeah. by the time I was out traveling the world, I'm like, man, I'm, I'm, this is cool. I'm, I'm about to move on to the next thing, you know? Okay. Some people can speed read. Some people, it takes five days or a week to read a chapter. For yeah. me, I was speeding through my chapters. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So for me, it was really like, all right, this modeling stuff is cool. Now I know I can make money. Now how do I leverage what I'm doing? And I didn't understand the word leverage at that time. Mm -hmm. It's funny, you can know things but not know the exact word for yeah. it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it was like, once I understood leverage, I understood, all right, I learned so much in this modeling business, in this fashion world. In this fashion world, I learned so much business, just being around the biggest brands, yeah. how they move, how much money they spend, what's to reinvest, are you okay not making money, are you okay with breaking even? Yeah. And most of these brands were, yeah. you know what I'm saying? So for me, it was like, man, I already moved past breaking even. I went out to New York with $500, you know, and then ended up turning it to six figures. Mm -hmm. So from six figures, it was like, okay, what do I do now? Wait, how did you turn to six figures? By modeling? By modeling. Oh yeah, Working. sure. Working with brands, you yep. know, not giving up, going to New, going to Europe, going to you know all the, the London and doing wherever fashion, you had to go, wherever I had to go. Yeah, you said yes. I, I said yes, and although it may have burdened me and it hurt me to be away from my family mm -hmm. and to be away from my loved ones, I had to go out there and hustle and do it. Yeah. So once I did that, man, my mind was just like, man, I could do whatever I want to do now. You know, you you bring up a good point too, and like my story is different. I'm older, but. I have a sales background and I was like in corporate America for years, right? Wow. But I started out selling cars, right? Okay. And I made six figures and I was awesome at it. And like, I didn't rip anybody That's off. That's the ultimate hustle, man. The ultimate hustle. It, so ultimate I always hustle. looked at it like, no matter what I do, I know I can always sell something. So what, what's the risk in trying a clothing brand or you know, trying music or anything like that? I think it's, did, did that help or do you need that? You think that safety net, thing to fall back on to to make it or nah, does it matter? No, nah, I don't think it matters because I think if you're gonna go full force in something, yeah. like again, and that's what took me to concrete. Mm -hmm. You know, that's modeling and deciding like I felt empty inside, like I wanted to do something, like I was making all this money and the people back home. I would go home mm -hmm. and everybody was still struggling. To me it's like, man, like what good is it to have the money if you can't either spend it with your other people yeah. or you can't enjoy it with them. So for me it was like taking everything that I knew putting it in a business. Well, talk about what was concrete. Oh, so again, modeling and everything brought me to concrete. Okay. You know what I'm saying? So I had this empty void inside me that I just wanted to help people. So I decided to make a nonprofit called Concrete. And we gave opportunities in art, sports, music, and entrepreneurship. And that was the whole thing behind it. It was just, I just wanted to help people. I, mm -hmm. didn't, I didn't want nothing in return. I, I, didn't, I didn't care. My thing was just, all right, man, I want to open a youth center and I want to help people. Cool. And so the idea of concrete came about, man, and I was so knowledgeable in, in making clothes and I understood like, okay, if I go here, I can get blanks mm -hmm. and I can go slap a $2 logo on the back, you know, and then I can sell it for a higher price because what I did in the fashion world, people mm -hmm. were, were paying attention you're to You're a me. brand, you're a premium brand. So now I was turning into a brand and I understood like, okay, if I leverage everything I learned in the modeling industry to come back and help people, mm -hmm. what's gonna happen? I decided to open a nonprofit. We opened the building in 2019, late 2019. Okay. Horrible timing, horrible timing. Yeah, pandemic, right? <laughs> horrible timing, but we had no clue what was going on. Oh, yeah, how you, did know? you know. So uh, we decided to open a nonprofit, and then in that time frame, again, COVID hit. So we were like, all right, man, we have to be self sufficient. We mm -hmm. have to make our own money because right now they're not dishing out money like that mm -hmm. unless you get a loan. And we tried so hard to stay away from a loan. We like, we don't want to do a loan, whatever. I took the 70000 I had saved up, put it into the building, wow. bought everything for uh, uh, the art portion, the entrepreneurship portion, and the music portion, and put it all in one building, in a 5,000 square foot building. So you basically donated, I donated 70 grand of real cash money. Yeah, for sure, to my community. This. Yeah, for sure. It's not like you're just setting something up and trying to get donations from out. This is, you've got skin nah, in the game. No, nah, you know, and it's funny, man, because I never like really understood yeah, it is. I mean, especially like coming from where I come from. So 
for me, it was like, it's not about the money. My thing is just giving people opportunity, mm -hmm. you know? And that's, that's all I wanted to do. So again, I told all my partners, I'm like, look, man, we have to be self-sufficient. Like, I don't want to get a loan. If we can stay away from a loan, let's stay away from a loan. Mm -hmm. But Smart. Let's, let's try to make this money. So we started hustling sweaters and t-shirts on the internet. And uh, I think we were profiting or we were making like close to eight to 10K a month nice. doing that. Okay. So it was, it was pretty cool for a while. Yeah. Then the pandemic got deeper. Then it was like lockdown. Then it was like, no kids can come out to your place. And you're still paying. And I still have to pay. You know, utilities and everything every month. Yeah. Utilities, we had to pay uh, the the rent. We had to pay everything that came along with the internet. People don't think about internet. Yeah. It's like, man, when you get a business, you have to have internet. Of course, yeah. And the internet for a business is a lot more expensive than your household. Yeah. So everything was running up. Everything was running up. And um, I understood two things from that experience. What? Well, really three. One, take the risk because you're gonna learn much more than you would trying to ask somebody how to do it, mm -hmm. you know? Two, I know how to make clothes and sell them. Three, I know how to start up a charity, you know what I'm saying? So that lead, that led me to where I'm at right now. Did you have to shut it down I, at, I at just, some point? I, I took the executive decision and decided to shut it down. Oh, and okay. I only made that executive decision because my son was about to be born. Oh, okay, congrats. And, and, and I had to pick and choose, did, did I wanna keep funding the community? Yep. Or do I got to start getting ready for my son? Of course. And I received a lot of backlash for closing that uh, because a lot of people couldn't see what I'm doing now and they still don't see it, which is fine. Mm -hmm. But I know what it takes to be bad at something and be great at it afterwards. So mm -hmm. I'm always, I'm good. I'm, I'm cool with starting <laughs> over, man. I have yeah. no problem starting yeah. over. But yeah, I received a lot of backlash for closing it. So 2021, we closed it. We were open two years. Okay. We helped as many kids as we could, especially with COVID supplies and kids with backpacks and just giving out grants, you know, we, mm -hmm. we, we did everything. But uh, fast forward 2021, we decided to close it. And uh, I, had, I had the option. I'm like, well, do I wanna do anything else? Do I just wanna be a dad? Do I just wanna go back to modeling? And then that's it, that'll be my life. But I'm like, man, I'm too smart, man. <laughs> I'm too smart, man. And uh, so that's where I'm at now, man. I decided to create 5417 and the Grand Institute of Mastery. So Concrete was then separated into two entities, okay. a nonprofit entity, the Grand Institute of Mastery, and then a, a clothing portion, or what I like to call just, it's, it's just something close to me. It's just the brand now, 5417. And the clothing funded the scholarships and everything, right? right. Is that how it works? When we had Concrete, yeah, for how, sure. How's it work now with Grand Institute? So now uh, the Grand Institute is more slowed down at a pace. I decided to slow it down okay. until I can make a certain amount of money doing this 5417, making music, creating clothing, making sustainable garments. Then I'm going to go ahead and bring it back because now I understand there's no point in me putting 70 grand of my money into something and then watching it just... I already learned how to do that, yeah. you know? So now the second time around, it's really just gonna be about building a brand mm -hmm. and then going ahead and, and doing what I need to do to get the funding for it. So the Grand Institute of Mastery would be like part two of Concrete for sure. So, okay, you got a clothing brand, which we'll talk about in a little bit, and you're making money and selling things. You're gonna take all the profits and put them in the, I mean, don't you want some money out of this too? Or well, are you gonna I was, just- I was already making money. Sure. I'm, I'm already modeling. I, I didn't really- Yeah, but you, you start a clothing brand. I mean, most companies you look and they go, hey, we donate 2% of pre-tax profits or something like that. You're taking all the profits and putting we it back all in this the thing? profit and put it back, for sure. No one does that. Yeah, I mean. My <laughs> You're name not is, everyone. My name is Jerron, bro. You know, and, and it's very seldom people out here named Jerron. I'm not, and that's, that's not even a two mile horn. It's just, that's the way I've always been. Mm -hmm. I don't really care about money like that because I grew up without it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, and. I think people got to understand, like, money don't make you successful. You know what, what makes I'm you successful? What in makes your me eyes? Or, or everybody what else? What makes you? What makes me successful is one, being able to take care of my family. Two, being able to take care of myself. Three, being able to be a positive influence on the people around me. Yeah. Even just those three, I'm already successful. And I don't even have to think about anything else. Everything else is a cherry on top. Yeah. You know, you can even say the money is sprinkles. You know what I'm saying? So I really don't, I, I'm not. I'm not dictated by a dollar worth. Mm -hmm. you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Like that don't mean that don't make me successful. And I understood that at a young age. So when you say like, well, nobody does that. I know nobody does that. You know, that's why they, everybody look at me so crazy because I I, I take risks mm -hmm. and I'm not afraid of taking risks. You know what I'm saying? I'm okay with being looked at like the crazy guy who would take all his money and go try to help his community out. Yeah. I'll be that guy. <laughs> I, I mean, know. you could easily just like everyone else go, okay, I'm gonna 
donate 70 grand to the Red Cross or whatever charity you're into but that and have no headaches and not do anything. No, you're right, man. But that's not going to help my neighborhood. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And that's not going to help the people that live in my neighborhood at all. True. You know, so, you know, for me, it's really just being able to give back, you know, and, and help people that, that I feel like may need it. You know, I think it's cool, like the entrepreneurship angle, especially because that kind of got you out of your situation. And, you know, like you said, your dad's selling shoes out front and like uh, my godfather. Are you sorry? Your godfather, yeah, my godfather was selling shoes. And then yeah. get, has his own store. Like, I love stories like that. Like, that's the American dream. Like, bam, right. There's an example of it. So I think it's important to teach kids that. So, like, how does it work? Do you have, you know, would your godfather come in and talk about, you know, starting a shoe company or like, how does it get oh, is, does it get taught to the kids like how does it work but he what's he, the structure he he was on us and uh every day we would wake up i mean i'm like eight or nine years old at this point yeah and uh so you imagine going into a shoe store and an eight or nine year old selling you shoes <laughs> it sounds ridiculous right yeah, it's it like does. i don't know if i could take this kid serious but we knew yeah. everything mm -hmm. we knew what was in stock what wasn't in stock he made sure we spoke to everybody with respect mm -hmm. and he always made sure he's always make sure you don't stink because we was kids, you know, we was dirty kids. I'm not lying to you. And if we stank, he'll be like, hey, man, you got to go home. No, I'm, I'm being dead for real. Like, so, you know, it was things like that that really taught me, like, all right, like, this is how you articulate. This yeah. is how you talk. If I, if I don't have a size, all right, man, look, I don't got it, but I got these, or you can come back next week mm -hmm. and provide options from there, you know? Yeah. So it's things like that that he was just like, hey, man, you know. You gotta do this if you want it. And he wouldn't really just talk to us. He would like be like, bro, you gotta do this. Like okay. he wanted he was like, I need money in my pocket. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you kids need to sell some shoes. Y'all need to sell some shoes. So the goal was always hundred pairs a day. Wow, that's moving some day. shoes. Hundred pairs a day, that was the goal. Some days we would hit it, you know, closer to the holidays, we always hit hundred pairs a day. Yeah. Um, but on the worst day, it'll probably be like 20 pairs a day. Okay. So we will always understand. At the end of the day, he'll talk, teach us how to count up the money. He wouldn't tell us how to count it. We would just be watching like, dang, he made a lot of money. The kids don't touch the money? Yeah, the kids don't <laughs> touch the money until he's ready to pay you. Yeah. You know, we was getting paid every day, almost $80 a day. Adds I'm, up when you're a kid. eight years old making $80 a day. It's real money. You know, but the thing about me was, and this is why I am who I am, what? I would take that money home and give it to my mom. Would you really? Wow. If my mom needed money, I'd give it to her. Okay. Even to this day. You weren't blowing it on Jordans or anything? Nah, I worked at a shoe store. Yeah, I guess so. Right? You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> that's, I'm trying to think of what I wanted when I was eight is Jordans, right? That's really all I wanted. Well, he had Jordans for us. Yeah. You know, he, he would even give us a discount. He'd be like, you want these? All right, you tell it to the public. Maybe, you know, Jordans was cheaper back then. It was yeah. probably like $100. Mm -hmm. Give me four dollars, you can take them. Okay. But don't tell nobody. <laughs> you know, he was that type of dude. But that really taught me my roots of entrepreneurship. Yeah. And it really taught me like, okay, at some point, you know, I'm gonna be able to utilize this stuff. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, now I'm here promoting five four one seven, a sustainable clothing brand. You know, we make music as well. The sustainable clothing is more like our merch. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And after going through years of making clothing, and then now it's like, okay, burning through clothing and burning through polyester and burning through cotton is it's not like it's it's the worst thing on the planet. You mm -hmm. know, there's there's I know there's worse things. Yeah. But it hurts. It it does hurt. And it, and if I can make a small change to my business concept, I'm gonna do it. Mm -hmm. You know. So now we're making sustainable clothing. So like you like this mouth from Mexico. Yeah, I, I do. This is something I will print on, flip it reverse. So now you got a reversible T-shirt. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's it's really just about giving people options now. You know? So what did, talk about that because I. I mean, I'm old, I don't know. But I was, re I was, you know, looking up 5417 and I was looking at the brand and stuff and it was like sustainably something. Sustainably upcycled. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, what the hell does that mean? Yeah, so instead of recycle, we upcycle it. We take it from what it is and then make it better. Oh, you take it up okay. Nice, you know what I'm saying? Okay. So it's like, and, and the funny thing is, man, I had a conversation the other day. And this dude was telling me he upcycles T-shirts, right? Okay. But he he would charge you three fifty for a T-shirt. Oh yeah. I'm like, man, like, I might as well make it from scratch, like, yeah. you know what I'm saying? You know what's funny? I you would probably know. You know the brand Ru. Okay. Yeah. yeah you yeah. know fashion. Yeah. You know. Shout out Ruiz. Yeah. yeah, yeah I, I was just shout out Ruiz. I interviewed yeah. him, and he. Do you know his story? You would love it. It's so he he's always into like flipping clothes. You go to Goodwill and like rich neighborhoods as a kid, mm -hmm. find some, you know, Louis or whatever, and then flip it and sell it to kids at school and stuff. So that was his deal. And he wanted a premium brand. Yeah. So he, he makes these shirts and he goes, They're gonna be three hundred dollars. Yeah. No one buys one. <laughs> because it's hard saying like 
this is a premium brand and it's worth 300. I'm not gonna sell it below that. And he said it was so bad that like after three months, he bought one of his own shirts through the website to make sure the website worked. <laughs> Because wow. he had no faith. Yeah, no, shout out Ruizzi, man. I He's spent a, cool a lot guy. of time with him out in Paris and going, oh, nice. going to shows. And, uh, you know, I remember meeting Ruizzi and then seeing where he's at now, man. That's that's the, that's the where it's at. You see what I'm saying? Hanging like, with Jay-Z. And... It's beautiful, man. But being bad at something and, and understanding you're bad at it. Yep. And then not caring and taking it to where you don't even know. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't think if you would have asked a young Ruizzi, if you would have been like, you know, like, do you think you're gonna sit down with Jay Z? Like, he might say, yeah, he might <laughs> have that. But, but I'm just saying, Maybe like, most people would say no. Most people would say no, and I think that's what's so beautiful is everybody's scared to take a risk and, and be bad at something and then watch themselves grow over time. You know, like, I, I was looking at this video today, man, and this guy asked him a question. He said, "What's the what's the moral of life? Like, what is what is the purpose of life?" Yeah. He said, um, "Enjoy time passing by." That's pretty good. You feel I me? Mean? So yeah, it's like if you can enjoy that time of being bad to go into good and yep. somehow find some type of medium, yeah. you're going to be great. You can still have those dreams and they can still come true even though you have a, a job you don't like that you're going to go to tomorrow. Yeah, I think if you really... You willing, can decide how those are beautiful. If, if you decide and make that decision in your mind where it's like, one, I'm going to fight my doubts and, and I'm going to start this and I'm going to be bad at it. And then at some point, I'm going to be good. And if you can have that conversation with yourself while working a nine to five, yep. hey, man, sky's the limit. You know what I'm saying? Not even sky's the limit no more. Mars the limit. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, yeah. man, life is crazy. We, we, we've really made it this far. So if you can make it this far, yeah. Ain't no telling what, what, what's to hold. Side hustles are beautiful, and I love there's a bunch of side hustle podcasts, and you hear about all these people kind of whether they're in school or they got some job, they're starting stuff on the side. Right. You know, you look at the Gary Vaynerchuks of the world's always kind of promoting that. Yeah. And I think it's great. You can start, I mean, whether it's flipping Pokemon cards or, you know, if you want it, you there's can, a way to get it. Hey, man, it, it's, that's why I say, like, Mars is the limit because... It's so many things that are so many ways to get it. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? 100%. And, and what really stops people is, and what limits people is the idea of what success is. You know, like to some people, what the idea of success is, it's like, oh, um, a million people ain't watching, so it ain't successful. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Where it's like, man, me, I'm like, man, I'm, I just put my first single out. And if 10 people listen to it, I'm already winning. <laughs> Yeah. I'm winning because at the end of the day, it's like, I'm, I'm, it, it don't matter. That, that's not what it's about. It's not about like being accepted by the world or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Well, that's tough. Talk about that, right? Because I'm not like that and I get wrapped up in that. I mean, this yeah. is YouTube and you look at numbers and you look at social media and you look at numbers and you're in that world too. Yeah. How do you not kind of, a lot of people, a lot of influencers and stuff, I've interviewed every big one on the planet. That's kind of how I started out. And kind of everyone eventually gets burned out by, because they place their self-worth on amount of likes, right? Or amount of followers, or am I growing this much? And if it doesn't happen, or somebody doesn't like a video, or they don't like the single, and there's not enough streams, they're just, they can't deal with it. Yeah, and, and you know, that is a, it's a big problem now, it being 22 and Mars being the limit. Like, that's one of the problems we deal with now. Like, you know, um, equating our success to a number, yep. whether it be number of likes, number of followers, like that equating to a number is so detrimental because numbers don't end. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like they don't, like you can have a billion dollars and I'm sure billionaires want a trillion. Yeah, you know, course, so yeah. it's like this never ending cycle that, that doesn't end. So I think you can easily get caught up in it, easily. How do you not get caught up in that, right? Yeah, you're but a I, model, I do. you're, I do, and you're working the for these luxury brands, you're making money, you're traveling the world. Yeah. How as a kid, you know, when you were starting dealing with success like that, how do you not get caught up in yourself and think you're the shit and, you I know, mean, think you're better than everybody? I mean, come on, that never popped up in your head once? And, and that's the thing. This where, girl likes me, like, yeah, yeah, look at me. No, that's, and no, those are things that are good for the moment. You yeah. know what I'm saying? But like, I understand the big picture at the end of the day. And for me, it's like always being able to, when I have those moments, mm -hmm. shed my tear for a minute or two, being able to step back 
and then be like, all right, it is what it is and keep it pushing. Yeah. And being able to just compartmentalize like, either that's coming out from a bad place anyway. Yeah. So just let it go. And that's the thing where it's like, where you put your time at and where you, where you invest your mental at is what you really gonna focus on. And some people are so focused on the numbers and not on anything else, yep. that's why they care so much. Yeah. So when you ask me like, how do you stay out of that? Yeah. I put my, my time into different things now, you know? I wake up in the morning, I, I get my son up, make sure I change his pamper, make sure he's good, you know, make sure his mama good. Then I go to the gym and work myself out. Okay. You know, so I go to the gym maybe two hours. Oh, wow. And do my thing and just, just to really just get a peace of mind. Mm -hmm. You know, then from there I come home, spend time with my son. Okay. You know, so I'm giving my- I see my, you smiling when you're saying that. Like, I love you can tell son. you enjoy that. I love my son, man. I, I genuinely do because, um, my life without him is different. And I, I've gotten to see that in, even in the past month, how yeah. different I Kids change the game. 100%, so be, I go back home with him. And then after that, I go to my office and make music. You know, so I'm, I'm, I'm never really like- That's a pretty good day. It, it's, it's a beautiful day, but in between, I'll check my stuff or post this and do this, but that's not what I'm waking up to do. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, I wake up to make sure my son is okay. I wake up to make sure I, he got what he need. Mm -hmm. I wake up to make sure I'm be I'm okay. Yeah. I'm make I'm waking up to make sure I'm being creative and mm -hmm. do what I need to do. Yeah. You know, so that's really it, man. Like people just getting too caught up on numbers because they put too much focus on the numbers. Like you're not gonna get anywhere like that. You know. So you have such a positive outlook, and like, did you? Do you read like a lot of self-help kind of spiritual books <laughs> and stuff, or is this like something you're born with? You know, I mean. Nah, man. Uh, especially coming. Where'd you from, get this philosophy from? I, I think. You know, and you know my my uh, my woman's brother, uh, Lim. He always asks me these. He like asked me how I was brought up. You yeah. know, because I was dating his sister, mm -hmm. and um, he was like, "You be reading a lot." Yeah. I was like, "Yeah, I mean, I had to. Like, coming from where I come from, I had a messed up mindset. Yeah. So course. so by the time I started making money, all I did was read. Oh, okay. All I did like like my goal was always to, like, man, I want my own library. Like, I want a big wall full of books yeah and i've got that now yeah now i, I got, got like a nook at my house with you got, like you just, got, I, i'm a reader man see, that's and i I'm just saying. got and we were talking before autobiography of malcolm x yeah to i mean the autobody the autobiography of ben franklin i mean i got yeah. all kinds of but different I, stuff i love books man and, and self-help books really changed my way of thinking you know i got a tattoo uh, Kaizen, and I always love that phrase. It's Japanese. It, they use it in manufacturing, but it means continuous improvement. Okay. And I think that's yeah, a that's, great, that's, that's kind of what you're talking about yeah. too, is like 100%, constantly, man. whether it's making clothes, how can we make it a little better? Or, you know, how can I get my workout a little better? Or, you know, whatever you do, that's kind of how I look at things now is like, it's those little improvements. It's not like a life changing thing. Right. It's just getting a little better every day. And then when you look in a year, you're like, wow, I came a far a long way, but you don't realize it day to day. Talk about music for a sec too. I'm a huge music guy. Like who were your, who'd you listen to growing up? Like what are your inspirations? Um, you know, my, my brother Ray, he got on my head one time. He was like, bro, you grew up listening to Drake. And then I'm <laughs> like, you know what? I'm not even gonna knock you. Dude's one of the greatest artists. Like, I, who's has I, more I, hits than Drake? I, I, I ain't mad at it. Yeah. But, you know, little did he know uh, the people I really listen to. I listen to a lot of Tupac. Okay. I listen to a lot of Nipsey Hussle. What's your favorite Tupac album? For me, it's All Eyes on Me. That one was great. That one was great. I I think um, that one had the most radio hits and the most it did, yeah, that yeah. people play today. Yep. That one has the most. Yeah, you're probably um, right. But I like Machiavelli. Yeah. Classic. Yeah, I, I like Machiavelli, man, because... You like Gritty or Tupac? Well, it, it was just like, the streets can push you there. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And, and it just seemed like they may have pushed him there. And that type of aggression and that type of anger is in everybody. You know what I'm saying? So it was just at a certain point in my life, I always related to it, like being able or trying to step back. Mm -hmm. And knowing inside, like, damn, I'm mad as heck. Like, oh, man, I'm heated. But like think about that bigger picture, mm -hmm. you know, and this tight rope that I'm walking, and it's like, all right, like, I'm gonna let that, I'm just let it be. But I still feel this way, and I'm about to put it into my art, and then they won't even know it. So how's that going? How's, how's I saw the post on Everybody Found on Instagram. I got kinda, it's kinda cool, cause you, like, take your followers, like us, along the journey with you, which is kinda cool to, yes, to watch. It's, it's been fun, man, so, you know, it's, it's a new journey that I'm on. It's mm -hmm. a new tight rope, you know, um, and the new tightrope is just being able to express myself for a long time. You know, I was a model and in the modeling industry, you can have a voice after a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. 
But me being the person that I am, I wasn't one of the ones that were, they, they were like, yeah, we want to hear what you have to say. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Which is fine. Mm -hmm. I understood it. It was it just one in my face, yeah. you know? So um, now it's really this journey of like being able to express myself and pe bringing the people that actually want to be along for the journey, mm -hmm. along with it. So we dropped the first single, 5417, and, you know, representation of the brand. Mm -hmm. So really it's, it's just a, a, a tall tale story of where I started. Mm -hmm and how I'm going down this path to greatness. And whoever want to come along the ride can come, you know? How do you, do you just release it yourself? Do you just work, hook up with a producer and then just upload yeah, whatever so you want? I, I got my boy, Austin 100, who was on the 5417 track. Okay. And uh, we, you know, we met each other the first time and uh, I think it was like maybe last year, maybe it was, it was during lockdown during COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, we just kept working. We just kept working. We ended up compiling almost like 50 to 100 songs. So we like, man, let's make let's make one that that's gonna go to mm -hmm. where we're both content with it. And uh, now we're making art that's like real content. I don't have to answer to nobody. I don't have that's to, the way to do it. I don't have to wait for or I don't have to make a specific type of record that people are gonna like. No, mm -hmm. this is really my story that I'm telling. And you know, my friend one time told me he was like, man, you can't put your whole story in one song. I'm like, <laughs> well, who's gonna tell me I can't? Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know and. I understand where he was coming from, but in all actuality, who's gonna tell me I can't? So. And you can do it. I mean, Jay Z's been telling the same story for what, twenty five mm -hmm. years. You know, and, and little pieces in each song. Yeah, and it's beautiful, man. And I, I think for me, that's what it's all about, man. Being able to share my story before the clock rings and before my time is up. And when it's checkout time, it's like I express myself to the utmost. Mm -hmm. You know, you got people like. Basquiat who did the same thing. You know, you got uh, Pablo Picasso who did the same thing. You know, and people don't know, man. Like. You not we not just put on this planet to do one thing, you know. Bringing up Basquiat, like people don't know, Basquiat used to play music. Mm -hmm. I didn't know. Ba Basquiat used to be a graffiti artist. Yeah, you know yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. Like people don't understand like what it takes for you to get to a certain point in life. That's why I said like these decisions you make in these fork in the roads mm -hmm. really dictate wherever else you're gonna go in life. Well, let's talk about this because the goal is all of these things is always to get you know some inspiration. We got a lot of inspiration for you, but like real tips from the guest area expertise. Now, you got a lot of interest, but you probably have the most skill set in the fashion world, right? Because that's where you spent a lot of your time and learned a lot. So everyone wants to start a clothing brand, and I'm sure somebody watching this was going, no one's buying my shirt, and no one's ever gonna buy it, and I don't have a social media following. How am I gonna sell these things? Like, yeah. what, you what know, lessons can you share I'm, with them? The, the biggest lesson I could give is, um, um, see, I'm a, I'm a guerrilla marketing type dude. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm word of mouth. Like, I'm like, if if I want to sell something mm -hmm. and and I know nobody's going to buy it, $100, $200, I'm going to go run my mouth so somebody buys it. You know what I'm saying? And I think if, if there's a young person that's watching this and they really want to be like, man, I, I just want to start a clothing brand. Yep. I just, I'm, I may be doubting myself or I'm, it's too much pressure. Like, I need some money. Mm -hmm. Like, man... Virgil started his clothing line by buying old polo shirts and with silk screen on the back. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And sell it with a 750% markup. And that's when they created Pyrex. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So to the young kid that's watching this, is one, your possibilities are endless. Two, if you can scrape up money, even $10, you can go to a Goodwill and even go get a shirt. Make your first sale just so you know you can sell one shirt. Yep. If you can sell one shirt, you can sell a thousand shirts. You know what I'm saying? Yep. And I think it's really just understanding like, it's a systematic way to making clothes. Mm -hmm. You know, depending- Talk about that. You were talking yeah. before about like ripping through nylon and stuff like yeah. that. Like how do you minimize your risk? I mean, I don't know anything about clothing. Well, well the thing is, it's like, people already make clothes. So it's like, yeah. I can go buy a hoodie and then slap my logo on it. Yeah. And then now that's, that's my clothing, mm -hmm. you know? So I, I always advise people like, man, go find a good blank, whatever that blank may be. Yep. Um, for the people in LA, you can go off of Pico and Main and find blanks. You can find blanks off the internet. Yep. And then you can easily, and this is the easiest way, okay. buy a heat press. Okay. You can buy a heat press for almost $120, mm -hmm. right? You can buy a heat press for $120, and you can find somebody to make the vinyls cut out with your logo on them, and then you can heat press on them. A blank costs you about $15 for a top and a bottom. Okay. $7.50 each. If I go buy me heat press, $120, right? Okay. But those, those vinyls 
are only about 50 cents each. Okay. You know what I'm saying? And if you're doing the labor, and if you want to add the, the, the heat press cost to your good, mm -hmm. 750 plus a 50 percent 50 cent tag that's eight dollars mm -hmm. and we'll we'll put 120 we'll put a dollar 20 right okay into each one okay now, what's my cost i lost track of math <laughs> what 10 11 bucks your, your cost is less than ten dollars yeah, yeah you okay. know what i'm saying and even if you sell it at 25 dollars, you just made 1.5 percent up or 1.5 points points yeah of what you initially made it for. Mm -hmm. So any kid is just like- the markup and clothes is crazy. It's, it is, and you and, and that's a low markup. Mm -hmm. You know, each by every every brand I've ever been to, they mark up at least, at least 2.5 points. Wow. At least. But they also have a big risk too. Fashion's so tough because it's it seasonal, right? So if yeah. you don't sell it, it's gone. You know, you just eat that, right? Yeah, you might have to eat it. You know, luxury brands burn it. You yeah, know, it's a write off, yep. you know, um, but you don't have to, though. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm a guerrilla marketing guy. So okay. to the young kid, again, go ahead, find the blank. Mm -hmm. You don't even have to put nothing on it if you don't want to. OK, you get what I'm saying? Yeah. You want a good flea market story? This is the greatest side hustle I've ever heard. So my dad was always in sales and he was like a sales manager for this company. Yeah. And he had like his number one sales guy that he wanted to promote to a sales manager. And he offered him a new job like 10 different times. And the guy's like, nope, I'm good, I'm good. So finally, he's like, don't you want to make more money for your family and kind of rise up through the ranks? And he goes, I'm good. He goes, I make 10 times what I make here on the weekends. And he's like, yeah. what the, what the f you do it on the weekends? Yeah. <laughs> so this is New Jersey. So he used to go down to North Carolina once a month with a big U-Haul truck. Mm. And they had the cotton um, textile plants down there. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. he would pay a guy like off the truck to get uh, socks, white socks, yeah. Nike branded, Adidas, whatever. Mm. He would bring them back and he would split it up. He would, he would take 75% of it and wholesale it to other guys who would right, go to right. flea markets and stuff. And then whenever he needed cash, he'd just go to a flea market Everybody needs socks. And he go three, you know, three pairs for 10 bucks or something, right? All day, all day. 100%, and I think that is, and that speaks more to, if you can find something that's so niche, like I, I've seen people buy socks, Nike socks, and dye them a specific hue that you can't find nowhere else, and they selling them $40. It's like, bro, $40 for one pair of socks? Yeah. And then people are buying them. You know what I'm saying? So it's like if a person can find something that's so niche that other people can't do or like don't want to do, yeah. do that shit. Custom Air Force Ones, right? Do they they cost you a hundred bucks. You see these guys on Instagram who are painting them and stuff and selling them for two grand. Three Dipping grand. them in coffee. Yeah. Making them look like they from the 90s. Yeah. Like, man, there's so many ways to get it. That's what I'm saying. Like, it's, Jay Z says something. It's so, it's, it's a lot of ways, a lot of information. But knowledge without the information is just information. You don't have the knowledge to understand it. And it, I, don't quote me, I'm, he might have said it yeah, different, yeah, but that's know. what I got from it, yeah. you know what I'm saying? So if you really want to get knowledgeable, then you look at the information, you know? But don't just scan through it and think you know. Like, no, nah, man, you're going to see the information, you're going to have to trial and error it, then. All right. Well, I think you did it, man. I'm, I'm we doing talked it. about everything. I'm doing You're doing it, it. I'm doing on, it. on many <laughs> levels. I'm doing it, man. Promote. I mean, go promote yourself. Come on, sell what you got going on. We hit the clothing brand. Right. We hit the Grand Institute. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, where can they? The, I went to the five one four seven website and it was down. You're gonna? Are you doing a new drop and then gonna redo the website? Where yeah, can they so, get it? So I'm currently redoing a new website. Okay. Um, it'll be configured completely differently. Um, we're trying to get ready for Web three so that people nice. can purchase, do, use it if they only have crypto, so on and so forth. Just as it's the way that the world is going, so I have to adapt yeah. to it, and it, it's necessary. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll be doing a new drop in uh, October, and then by October time, the website will be up. But if you follow me at Jerron McKinley, G-E-R-O-N-M-C-K-I-N-L-E-Y, you'll be able to find all the new music, all the new sustainable clothing, and a new website, man. I'm constantly giving advice of anybody want or need advice, like don't hesitate, man. I'm not no dude that don't reply to DMs. If I see the DM, then I got you, you know what I'm saying? Man, it was really, it was man, a pleasure, Tom, man, sitting down here. I learned no, a lot, thank too. You, man. I'm, I'm, I'm just grateful to be here, man. Nice. I'm grateful, man. I'm we grateful covered. I met you. This was great. No, 100%, man. Again, I, I come from, you know, um, 
the nitty gritty. So yeah. for me to be here and then against this white wall, it's like, oh man, I must be doing all right. <laughs> <laughs> well guys, make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications. New interviews every Tuesday at 10 a.m. with the biggest entrepreneurs in the world and really from all walks of life. Like upcoming, I've got Rich the Kid, then I've got Sean Rad, the founder of Tinder. Oh, so I'm talking dope. about all over the place. Dope. So startup people, artists and entertainers, celebrity entrepreneurs, you'll get some inspiration every week, but you also get real concrete lessons on how to start and grow your business. So thanks so much, guys. All good. Peace out. <laughs>